Have I got a treat for you guys today? I'm taking a deep in-depth look at the Infrared Tube Series TS60 scope. It is a 1280 pixel, uh, 18 millikelvin thermal, and we're gonna see just how good it is. Now this is probably one of the most affordable um, high definition thermals on the market at the moment. And when I say that, I mean uh, you probably only have to sell one kidney. So let's dive in and check out the image quality and how to operate this bad boy. And uh, you can be the judge and see what you think of it. Coming up, we're gonna take a look at the image quality on this device, as well as how to operate it, how to calibrate the rangefinder, as well as how to zero it. Let's dive in deep and take a closer look. Before we move on to image quality, I wanted to comment on just how amazing the screen is inside the TS60. It has the same screen as the TH50 and is by far some of the best viewing you will have on a thermal at the moment. Now let's take a look at the image quality on the TS60. These are recordings done on the device and typically speaking, the quality of recordings isn't as good as what you see through it. In the case of the TS60, it does appear to me to be a lot better than previous models and a good indication of the experience you will have out in the field. As you'll see as you continue to watch this image review, uh, we have 20 kilo dogs from 10 meters all the way out to 300 meters to give you an idea of image quality at different distances. We do very similar tests in all our reviews. This way we can show results under similar conditions on the same animals at the same distances. To give you a better idea, we now show the temperature and humidity at the time of recording in the review. In some of our old reviews, we forgot to include this. If you do see reviews without it shown, it was most likely recorded in favorable weather. As you know, weather conditions can greatly affect results. And in the case of the TS60, these recordings were also done in favorable conditions in colder weather as illustrated. In my experience, the millikelvin rating of thermals plays a big part in how it will perform in high temperatures, high humidity, or when there is fog or moisture in the air. A big benefit to the TS60 is its 18 millikelvin sensor that produces some amazing footage. If you're not aware, the lower the millikelvin, typically the better the image quality. Due to the large sensor size and the 60 millimeter lens, the TS60 has a very wide field of view. I found the image quality to be amazing on the base mag and even under a bit of zoom, it was still really good. But when you zoom all the way in, I felt it slightly underperformed to my expectations of what a high definition sensor could do, especially 1280 pixels, but it was still well above and beyond pretty much all the other options available at the moment. If you find our reviews helpful, we would greatly appreciate it if you would consider making your next purchase with us. We stock all the major brands and accessories and can offer you unbiased advice to help you decide on your next purchase. Not only that, we back it up with the best after sales service. We also price match, we ship Express Australia wide and can have your order to your door in two to four days in 99% of cases. So feel free to give us a call or jump on our website and take a look. Now let's take a look at the different color palettes. We have the usual white hot, which is my preference. Then we have black hot, red hot, a rainbow type palette. I believe this one is a sepia type palette. Then we have red monochrome and green monochrome. Plenty of options there. I see a lot more people using the monochrome style uh, ones lately, so might be worth checking those out in the field. Before moving on, let's take a look at the image quality comparison between the TS60 with the 1280 pixel sensor and the TH50 version two with the 640 pixel sensor. These recordings were done under similar conditions, but at different times. 
The results, however, are still a good indication of how much better the TS-60 is. We won't go into massive detail and instead just focus on the comparison of the quality on max zoom level at the different distances all the way out to 300 meters. When we recorded the 300 meter distance for the TH-50, we used a human as the subject, so it's not a direct comparison, but the TS-60 is still a clear winner by far. All right, so we have the infrared tube TS-60 here, 1280 pixel sensor, and we're gonna take a quick look at the box before we look at the thermal itself. Apparently, looking inside the box is tradition. So our bag was on top there, that's what our scope's in, and then we have this little box in the bottom there, which has the charger in it, um, a, bat, a strap for your bag, cable, and a wall outlet charger. Tradition done. It's in the bag. Oh, nothing. Where'd it go? That's uh, all right, it's over here. There's the TS-60. We, it actually comes with two batteries, I'm, I'm mistaken. There's one inside it and then this one here. All right, we also have the uh, eye relief inside the bag here, screws on the front, gives you a bit of eye cushion there. And then in the top here, we have our manual and a cleaning cloth and some targets, some heat patch targets. All right, let's get rid of that thing and let's take a look at the actual scope. All right, the TS-60, it's virtually identical to the other tube scopes, in particular the TH-50 version two. It has a 60 millimeter lens uh, with the focus ring at the front here. The sensor is an 18 millikelvin 1280 pixel sensor, and it certainly produces some amazing image quality as you have already seen. Another addition to the TS-60 is it comes with an already fitted Picatinny rail, quick detach, appears to be really good quality. Um, so that is awesome. Now we have the zoom ring here, which also doubles up as a button and allows you to navigate the menus. On the right hand side here, we have our charge port, which is USB-C, which is what we love to see. Now that will charge the internal batteries. On the left hand side, we have our additional battery bay where we can put in an 18650. It used to be an 18500 in the TH-50s but it's an 18650 now. You will have to charge that separately with the other charger, but. Down the front here, we have the same buttons that we've seen on the TH-50. We have our power button, our brightness button, our record button, and our pallet button. So single press to change pallets. Um, on the record button here, press and hold to record, single press to take a photo. And we've already gone through this with the TH-50, so we won't go into too much detail there. And then obviously our eye adjustment here. Now we also have the rubber eye relief here, which you can screw in. Now it gives you a nice good cushion on your eye there. I like the screw in ones, the ones that just clip in always fall off and drive you nuts. Now the TS-60 is very similar in a lot of ways to the other tube models such as the TH-50 version two. So coming up, we're actually going to take a look at the recordings that we did on navigating the menus, what the buttons do, how to zero it, and how to calibrate the LRF. I didn't want to re-record them all over again because they're literally 99% the same, but we will point out some differences in different areas. Simply put the main key differences that it will now have ballistics calculation and it has recoil activated recording and this unit has the new 1280 pixel sensor. Other than that, very, very similar devices. Now, what do the buttons do? So obviously we've got the power button. A lot of these buttons have different functionality um, if you press and hold them or if you hold two buttons at once. So if you press and hold the brightness button, it'll actually activate the range finder laser. So this is the laser to help you sight in the range finder. Now, how you actually sight this in, which we'll touch on in depth a bit later on, what you do is Inside the menu on the scope, you put your um, crosshair for your laser rangefinder where you would like it to appear on the screen. You may want to sight this rangefinder into your actual shooting reticle, but if you don't want to, if you want to have a different reticle for your laser rangefinder, you can position it where you want 
And then you want to put the laser on a target, on the same target that your laser rangefinder um, reticle is also on, and then that will align it to that um, target. So quite simple there. To actually move this rangefinder to point um, at a different direction, you undo some Allen keys bolts here, just a little bit enough so that you can move this rangefinder around. Okay, it's actually on a, a ball in there that moves when this is loosened off, which allows you to point it where you need to. Okay, now obviously to turn the rangefinder on, we have our power button here. You just press and hold it for briefly. And then we have our battery compartment for the rangefinder, which is a 123A battery. Okay, back to looking at the buttons here. So we have our brightness button here. Um, now, if you just press single press this, it will make the um, brightness of the image higher or lower. It'll cycle through the brightness levels. Um, and then um, if you press and hold that button, it'll actually activate the rangefinder laser. Okay. Now we've got our record button here. Now if you single press this, we'll take a photo. Long press will start recording. Now on the other side here, we have our palette changing button. So single press will change to a different palette. A long press on the palette button will engage the picture in picture mode, which will show a more zoomed in picture at the top of the screen. Okay, so our dial here, so zooming in and out, um, like this and then if you want to open up the quick access menu a single press will open up the quick access menu and then you can use this to navigate that menu and then another single press to activate one of the options within that menu. Um, then if you want to um, get out of the menu you can press and hold or if you just wait it'll get out of it on its own. Another neat feature is if you are in a menu and you want to go back or get out of it quickly, you can just press the power button once, which will make you go back to the previous location. Okay, now, so to get into the main menu, you press and hold this button and it'll open up a menu on the side. Once again, you can scroll this wheel to navigate through that menu and then a single press to activate into the next set of menus and uh, once again, a single press to go into the next menu and so on. Um, a single press on the power button to go back a menu or press and hold this menu button to go back to the previous menu. A lot of these buttons double up to do different functions when you press and hold two at the same time. Okay, so if you press and hold these two buttons at the same time when you first get the scope, it'll turn the scope into a actual scope which is funny to say, but it comes with the reticle disabled. And to activate those functions, you need to press and hold these for quite a while um, for it to actually allow you to access the uh, reticle and the scope options. Now, when you are sighting this in and you need to do your freeze frame, the, these two buttons here will allow you to do the freeze frame. So if you press and hold these two buttons, that's how you'll do your freeze framing. Okay, so just remember that um, everything that I'm telling you here is in the manual. So if you get caught or if I've missed something, just um, download the manual and have a look at that. Um, but in addition, another two button option is if you press and hold the palette button and the brightness button at the same time and you have the range finder attached, it will actually change between continuous ranging and single ranging modes. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So some of the secondary functions of the power button, if you single press it, it will actually do an image calibration, a manual image calibration. Okay, to put the device in standby mode, um, you long press the power button, but don't hold it in all the way through the countdown. If you hold it all the way through the three, two, one countdown, it'll actually turn it all the way off. But as soon as you see the numbers come up, if you release it, it will go into standby mode. And then to wake it up again, just a single press on the power button. Now, if you have a single range finding mode on, so that's where it just gets a single distance for you, um, you can uh, just single press on this, will do a single range find for you. In addition, if you're doing a pixel repair, um, a single press on this will allow you to add or remove a pixel repair. Now, keep in mind, if you do use the power button to go back a menu, um, it won't save any changes that you've done according to the manual. 
So if you want to actually save your changes, so say you've um, done some changes to your zeroing, you want to press and hold your menu button to actually complete the save. If you single press on this, it may delete the information that you've done. So keep that in mind. All right, that's about all I can think to cover in this um, review today. If you have any more questions about this thermal, please give us a ring or you can jump on our website too if you'd like to make an order. You can also ring us if you want to make an order. Um, but we're here to help you make the best decision about your next thermal purchase. Now to do firmware updates on these infrared devices, you can only do it currently through the mobile app, which we will have another video on uh, how to actually connect this to Wi-Fi um, and then do an update and stuff through the app. But we're not going to cover that in this video. Um, because it's basically the same on all infrared products. So we don't want to keep going over it again and again in every video we do. Um, but that's how you do it if you need to do it right now. The TS60 has pretty much an identical menu system to the other models. So what we're going to do is firstly highlight the key differences and then we'll move on to the normal menu system that you will presently have on the older models. They are talking about bringing these features to a lot of these, but I can't confirm which ones and when just yet. So let's quickly take a look at the differences. First up, you'll notice that we have a recoil activation option now. It's a very simple feature that you just turn on and off. It has no settings at this present moment. That will just take a recording when recoil is detected. Then if we go down, we now have a new uh, menu option for ballistics calculation. Now in here, you have the option at the top to turn it on or off, and then you can select a profile. You can have up to five profiles for each type of ammunition or maybe for different firearms, depending on your situation. And then we have our SPOA, which is our reticle that will show when we do a ballistics calculation. So it stands for suggested point of aim. And then we go into there and we can choose what will appear in the location where it thinks the shot will land. Now you can change a lot of these settings in the Infrared Outdoor app. In fact, some parameters are only available in the app, but most of the necessary ones are available inside the scope itself. So if we go into our parameter settings, we can change our ballistics profile, our ballistics coefficient, weight, muzzle velocity, scope height, zeroing distance, temperature and altitude. Okay. As with any other menu options, single press to open the menu and single press to make selections. And if you hold in the button, it will take you back to the previous menu or save the changes that you are making. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through everything related to ballistics on this scope but it essentially works the same as pretty much all the other scopes on the market. You put in your ballistics information. When you do a range find, it'll make a suggestion on where you, it thinks you should aim. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. You just need to get your ballistics information correct and you should have some pretty good success. One of the only other changes that I've noticed is that we now have a contrast changing setting in the quick access menu. Um, but apart from that, it's all the same. And we'll cover the menu system in full from here on. I just wanted to highlight the key differences between the new TS60 and the older models. And that there is pretty much the only differences. All right, let's take a look at the menus first. So we have our ultra clear image at the top there. That's um, just um, the just the image as to what they think will look better. Then we go down and we have our Wi-Fi on and off. We have our Bluetooth on and off. Now this is for your range finder. Um, so you want to have this turned on if you want it to connect to your range finder. And you can actually go into this adjustment here, um, go into search, and when you turn your range finder on, it should show up there. So there's our number there. That's our range finder. And we've got it turned on at the moment. We have our motion sensors, compass, um, laser calibration, which we'll go through shortly. We have our zeroing profiles, our reset zeroing distance, our image calibration, our standby on and off modes, our pixel defect correction, compass calibration, 
And lastly, settings, and then inside the settings we have our date, time, language, um, meters or yards, our status bar displays, our image hue, so that'll be warm and cold, hot. If we change it to cold there, we might give that a bit of a spin. Then we've got our factory reset and our info down the bottom here. So very straightforward there, we'll go back now. All right, now let's quickly run through the quick access menu, which allows you to change the reticle and stuff like that. So a single press on your menu button will bring up this quick access menu, which allows you to switch between your meter distances that you've sighted in, allows you to cycle through your reticle. And in addition to that, um, it allows you to change the color of your reticle. Okay. Green's not a bad one. And then in addition, we have our contrast here that we can change. So you can see that made quite a big difference there, going from two to three. And then that's basically the quick access menu in a nutshell right there. And we're gonna show you how to zero it and how to calibrate the range finder if I don't get washed away by the storm that's coming in. Now, one thing that I really like about the infrared unit is the round screen. It's got a beautiful round screen in it. As you can see there now, I'll just get out of this menu. As you can see, it's got a really nice big round screen in there and the image quality is really awesome. And it shows information at the bottom. We've got our battery on the right hand side there. And that's that. So we'll continue on. I've just got to do as much as I can quickly before I get washed away here. All right, so I'm just going to do a demonstration on how I like to sight in thermals. Um, usually I'll get a big piece of cardboard, even bigger than this one. Um, me personally, I prefer using the heated targets. So these patches. You can also use these reflective targets. You put them up and you put them on a slight angle so you can see it through the scope. The heated ones seem to work quite good for me, especially these um, infrared ones, you get a couple with the scope usually. So basically I'd sight it in for 30 or 50 meters and then go out to 100 meters from there. Um, the bigger the piece of cardboard you have, the better in my opinion, um, or your target so that you can easily see where your shot lands if it is way out. I'll aim at this heat patch and then if the bullet, say, lands down here, I'll come out and I'll stick a bit of foil on it, like maybe one of these um, silver stickers here or one, another one of these heated patches. Now, you don't need these expensive things. You can just use aluminium foil. I prefer doing it this way. All right, we're going to take a look at the zeroing process now. So I've got to record this using my camera um, as the infrared stuff doesn't record the menus uh, when you press record on the scope itself. So here we have a heated patch at the top there and our target down below. I prefer the heated patches, particularly at a longer distance. Um, we're very, very close to this target at the moment just for this video. So in our zeroing profiles, we've got A, B and C. So we've got our A zeroing profile selected now, and then we'll go down to our zeroing distances and we will select uh, 100, 200 or 300. Now you can adjust this. You can change the meterage here. Now you wanna make sure that these are all a different distance now, because if they're all 100 meters, then your scope might select the wrong profile next time you turn it on because they're all the same. Um, we've seen users having that issue. Now, if we press our um, menu button to access it and we can go into our zeroing here and we can make adjustments. Now, we want to do our freeze frame. To keep it simple, let's just say that I've taken a shot at the center of this target and that heat patch at the top is where the bullets landed. Now, if that was the case, we'd press and hold the palette button and the photo button at the same time while it is on the center of the target there. Now, it's frozen there now. So now all we have to do is use our scroll wheel to move our crosshair up or left and right. So I'm moving it to the right there now. I don't want to do that. I'll move it back. Here we go to the Y axis. Now we can go up and down. So we'll take it all the way back up to our heat patch. 
and just a little bit to the right by the looks of that. I might be going to get washed away here. You can change your reticle so you can see it a lot better. I've got it set on a very small reticle because that's what I like. Now we've got it up there on our heat spot. I can press and hold the menu button and it'll save it. So it's now moved the zeroing to where that heat patch is. Presuming I originally took a shot at the center there now. Now briefly before I go, if you go in here and you scroll down to the 100 meters, that's how you can actually adjust it. And if you keep pressing your menu button, it'll cycle through the numbers there. And if you press and hold, it'll move out of it. All right, I'm gonna briefly run through how to calibrate the, the laser rangefinder before I get wet here, which I think is gonna be very, very shortly. Um, so this here, you can undo these Allen keys, loosen them off a little bit, and that allows you to move this around. And what you wanna do is turn your laser on. As you can see, I've got the laser turned on. And to do that, you press and hold the brightness button on the thermal until the laser turns on. You do that before you enter the menus. And then on the scope itself, you go into the menus and you go down to your calibration for your laser calibration there. You select that. Now this is where you would put your laser rangefinder target. Now as you can see, I've moved mine to the bottom because I don't want it showing up on the screen. Okay, so I'm just using my crosshair as the rangefinding distance. In my rangefinding calibration, if I put the crosshair um, where I want the laser to be and sight it in with the laser, then that square now would be my range finding square. So I'd put that square on my target and it'd tell me how far away it is. Then I'd bring my um, crosshair down to take the shot. Now what I've done is I've just sighted my laser into the actual crosshair roughly and I've just moved the square out of the way. Quickly run over it again. So we turn our laser on. We get this loosened off just a little bit so that we can move this around. So that's got a little ball in there that can move. And then we want to put point our scope where we want our laser to be. Okay, so something over there that we want to look at. And then we point our scope at it. So say it's this little square. We want it on that heat patch. We put that on the heat patch. And then we get our laser and we move our laser here. And make our laser point at that same heat patch. And then your laser range finder will be calibrated to that position there.